the ending of the Civil War destroyed temporarily all chances of the House of Rothschild to get a clutch on our money system, such as they had acquired in Britain and other nations in Europe. I say temporarily because the Rothschilds and the masterminds of the conspiracy never quit. So they had to start from scratch, but they lost no time in getting started. Shortly after the Civil War, a young immigrant who called himself Jacob H. Schiff arrived in New York. Jacob was a young man with a mission for the house of Rothschild. Jacob was the son of a rabbi born in one of Rothschild's houses in Frankfurt, Germany. I won't go deeply into his background. The important point is that Rothschild recognized in him not only a potential money wizard, but more important, he also saw the latent Machiavellian qualities in Jacob that could, as it did, make him an invaluable functionary in the great One World Conspiracy. After a comparatively brief training period in the Rothschild's London Bank, Jacob left for America with instructions to buy into a banking house, which was to be the springboard to acquire control of the money system of the United States. Actually, Jacob came here to carry out four specific assignments. Number one, and most important, was to acquire control of America's money system. Number two, find desirable men who, for a price, would be willing to serve as stooges for the great conspiracy and promote them into high places in our federal government, our Congress, in the U.S. Supreme Court, and all federal agencies. Number three, create minority group strife throughout the nations particularly between whites and blacks. Number four, create a movement to destroy religion in the United States, but Christianity to be the chief target. Earlier I stated that Jacob Schiff came to America with orders by Rothschild to carry out four specific directives. The first and most important one was to get control of the United States money system. Let's trace Schiff's step to accomplish that directive. As a first step, he had to buy into a banking house, but it had to be the kind of a house that he could absolutely control and mold for that primary objective of entrapping our U.S. money system. After carefully scouting around, Jacob bought a partnership in a firm that called itself Kuhn and Loeb. Like Schiff, Kuhn and Loeb were immigrants from German Jewish ghettos. They came to the United States in the mid-1840s. Both started their business careers as itinerant pack peddlers. In the early 1850s, they pooled their interests and set up a merchandising store in Lafayette, Indiana, under the firm name of Kuhn and Loeb, servicing the covered wagon settlers on their way west. In the years that followed, they set up similar stores in Cincinnati and St. Louis. Then they added pawnbroking to their merchandising pursuits. From that to money lending was a short and quick step. By the time Schiff arrived on the scene, Kuhn and Loeb was a well-known private banking firm. And this is the firm Jacob bought into. Shortly after he became a partner in Kuhn and Loeb, Schiff married Loeb's daughter, Teresa, then he bought out Kuhn's interests and moved the firm to New York, and Kuhn and Loeb became Kuhn, Loeb and Company, international bankers with Jacob Schiff, agent of the Rothschilds, ostensibly the sole owner. And throughout his career, this blend of Judas and Machiavelli, the first hierarch of the Illuminati, great conspiracy in America, posed as a generous philanthropist and a man of great holiness, the cover-up policy set forth by the Illuminati. As I have stated, the first great step of the conspiracy was to be the entrapment of our money system. To achieve that objective, Schiff had to get full cooperation of the then big banker elements in America, and that was easier said than done. 
Even in those years, Wall Street was the heart of the American money mart, and J.P. Morgan was its dictator. Next in line were the Drexels and the Biddles in Philadelphia. All the other financiers, big and little, danced to the music of those three houses, but particularly to that of Morgan. All of those three were proud, haughty, arrogant potentates. For the first few years, they viewed the little bewhiskered man from the German ghettos with utter contempt. But Jacob knew how to overcome that. He threw a few Rothschild bones to them, said bones being distribution in America of desirable European stock and bond issues. Then he discovered he had a still more potent weapon in his hands in the following. It was in the decades following our civil war that our industries began to burgeon. We had great railroads to build. The oil, mining, steel, textile industries were bursting out of their swaddling clothes. All that called for vast financing. Much of that financing had to come from abroad. That meant the House of Rothschild. And that was when Schiff came into his own. He played a very crafty game. He became the patron saint of John D. Rockefeller, Edward R. Harriman, and Andrew Carnegie. He financed the Standard Oil Company for Rocky, the Railroad Empire for Harriman, and the Steel Empire for Carnegie. But instead of hogging all the other industries for Kuhn Loeb and Company, he opened the doors of the House of Rothschild to Morgan, Biddle, and Drexel. In turn, Rothschild arranged the setting up of London, Paris, European, and other branches for those three but always in partnerships with Rothschild subordinates. And Rothschild made it very clear to all those men that Schiff was to be the boss in New York. Thus, at the turn of the century, Schiff had a tight control of the entire banking fraternity on Wall Street, which by then, with Schiff's help, included Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs, and other internationalist banks, headed by men chosen by the Rothschilds. In short, that meant control of the nation's money powers, and he was then ready for the giant step, the entrapment of our national money system. Now, under our Constitution, all control of our money system is vested solely in our Congress. Schiff's next important step was to seduce our Congress to betray that constitutional edict by surrendering that control to the hierarchy of the Illuminati's great conspiracy. In order to legalize that surrender and thus make the people powerless to resist it, it would be necessary to have Congress enact special legislation. To accomplish that, Schiff would have to infiltrate stooges into both houses of Congress, stooges powerful enough to railroad Congress into passing such legislation. Equally, or even more important, he would have to plant a stooge in the White House, a president without integrity and without scruples, who would sign that legislation into law. To accomplish that, he had to get control of either the Republican or the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party was the more vulnerable. It was the hungrier of the two parties. Except for Grover Cleveland, the Democrats had been unable to land one of their men in the White House since before the Civil War. There were two reasons for that. Number one, poverty of the party. Number two, there were considerably more Republican-minded voters than Democrats. The poverty matter was not a great problem, but the voter problem was a different story. But as I previously said, Schiff was a smart cookie. Here is the atrocious and murderous method he employed to solve that voter problem. His solution emphasizes how very little the Jewish internationalist bankers care about their own racial brethren, as you shall see. Suddenly, around 1890, there broke out a nationwide series of pogroms in Russia. Many, many thousands of innocent Jews, men, women, and children were slaughtered by the Cossacks and other peasants. Similar pogroms with similar slaughter of innocent Jews broke out in Poland, Romania, and Bulgaria. 
All those pogroms were fomented by Rothschild agents. As a result, Jewish terrified refugees from all those nations swarmed into the United States, and that continued throughout the next two or three decades because the pogroms were continuous through all those years. All those refugees were aided by self-styled humanitarian committees set up by Schiff, the Rothschilds, and all the Rothschild affiliates. In the main, the refugees streamed into New York, but the Schiff-Rothschild humanitarian committees found ways to shuffle many of them into other large cities, such as Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, Detroit, Los Angeles, etc., all of them were quickly transformed into naturalized citizens and educated to register as Democrats. Thus, all of that so-called minority group became solid Democratic voter blocks in their communities, all controlled and maneuvered by their so-called benefactors. And shortly after the turn of the century, they became vital factors in the political life of our nation. That was one of the methods Schiff employed to plant men like Nelson Aldrich in our Senate and Woodrow Wilson in the White House. At this point, let me remind you of another of the important jobs that was assigned to Schiff when he was dispatched to America. I refer to the job of destroying the unity of the American people by creating minority group and racial strife. By the pogrom-driven Jewish refugees into America, Schiff was creating one ready-made minority group for that purpose. But the Jewish people as a whole, made fearful by the pogroms, could not be depended upon to create the violence necessary to destroy the unity of the American people. But right within America, there was an already made to order, although as yet a sleeping minority group, the Negroes who could be sparked into so-called demonstrations, rioting, looting, murder, and every other type of lawlessness. All that was necessary was to incite and arouse them. Together, those two minority groups, properly maneuvered, could be used to create exactly the kind of strife in America the Illuminati would need to accomplish their objective. Thus, at the same time that Schiff and his co-conspirators were laying their plans for the entrapment of our money system, they were also perfecting plans to hit the unsuspecting American people with an explosive and terrifying racial upheaval that would tear the people into hate fractions and create chaos throughout the nation. Of course, perfecting those plans required time and infinitely patient organizing. First of all, they had to create leaderships and organizations to draw in millions of dupes, both Jewish and Negroes, who would do the demonstrating and commit the rioting, looting, and lawlessness. So in 1909, Schiff, the Laymans, and other conspirators organized and set up the National Association for the Advancement of the Colored People, known as the NAACP. The presidents, directors, and legal counsels of the NAACP were always white men, Jews appointed by Schiff. Then, in 1913, the Schiff group organized the Anti-Defamation League of the B'nai B'rith, commonly known as the ADL, to serve as the Gestapo and Hatchet Man outfit for the entire great conspiracy. It was in 1908 that Schiff decided the time had come for his seizure of our money system. His chief lieutenants in that seizure were Colonel Edward Mandel House, whose entire career was that of chief executive and courier for Schiff, as I shall show, Bernard Baruch and Herbert Lehman. In the fall of that year, they assembled in secret conclave at the Jekyll Island Hunt Club, owned by J.P. Morgan at Jekyll Island, Georgia. Among those present were J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, Colonel House, Senator Nelson Aldrich, Schiff, Stillman and Vanderlip of the New York National City Bank, W. and J. Seligman, Eugene Meyer, Bernard Baruch, 
Herbert Lehman, Paul Warburg, in short, all of the international bankers in America, all of them members of the hierarchy of the Illuminati's great conspiracy. A week later, they emerged with what they called the Federal Reserve System. Senator Aldrich was the stooge who was to railroad it through Congress. But they held that railroading in abeyance for one chief reason. They would first have to plant their man, an obedient stooge, in the White House to sign the Federal Reserve Act into law. They knew that even if the Senate would pass that act unanimously, the then newly elected President Taft would promptly veto it. So they waited. In 1912, their man, Woodrow Wilson, was elected to the presidency. Immediately after Wilson was inaugurated, Senator Aldrich railroaded the Federal Reserve Act through both houses of Congress, and Wilson promptly signed it, and the Federal Reserve Act became law. That heinous act of treason was committed in December 23, 1913, two days before Christmas, when all the members of Congress, except for several carefully picked representatives and three equally carefully picked senators were away from Washington. How heinously treasonous was that act? I'll tell you. Our founding fathers knew full well the power of money. They knew that whoever had that power held the destiny of our nation in his hands. Therefore, they carefully guarded this power when they set forth in the Constitution that Congress, the elected representatives of the people, alone would have that power. The constitutional language on this point is brief, concise, and specific, stated in Article 1, Section 8, Paragraph 5, defining the duties and powers of Congress, and I quote, to coin money, regulate the value thereof, and a foreign coin, and the standard of weights and measures, unquote. But on that tragic, unforgettable day of infamy, December 23, 1913, the men we sent to Washington to safeguard our interests, the representatives and senators and Woodrow Wilson, delivered the destiny of our nation into the hands of two aliens from Eastern Europe, Jacob Schiff and Paul Warburg. Warburg was a very recent immigrant who came here on orders from Rothschild for the express purpose of blueprinting that foul Federal Reserve Act. Now, the vast majority of the American people think that the Federal Reserve System is a United States government-owned agency. That is positively false. All of the stock of the Federal Reserve Banks is owned by the member banks, and the heads of the member banks are all members of the hierarchy of the great Illuminati conspiracy known today as the CFR.